you need to inspire them to do good. You need to explain to them that they can have a good life, that they, many of them can marry, they can have children, but they will need some assistance. They need that umbrella over them. That it's okay to have FASD. That they can still live a good, productive life. That they can give hope to others. I, I tell my children, you know, you did a really good thing today. I was talking on the phone to somebody and I told them about how well you were doing it and it gave them hope that they can be a good productive citizen, so to speak, that they can do good in life, that they can be a good team player, and that the price is too high for them not to do good. I had a call the other day from a lady and, and her son is 30 years old. He is not dead and he's not in prison, so he's in the 40th percentile, the people who do not do that. Well, he had started drinking. His girlfriend had left him. He quit working and just wouldn't show up to work. And, and his mother would say, well, honey, she left you because you started drinking and you wouldn't go to work. And he, he said, well, she really loved me, though. She wouldn't leave me for those reasons. The price that he was paying to drink was too high. It was just simply too high. They need to walk the straight and narrow. Negativity, that's something really big to deal with. It's something you have to fight against. You have to point it out when you see it. Uh, you'll often hear them say, I'm stupid or I'm just a retard. You need to build their self-esteem. You need to say, don't talk that way. That's not healthy for you. They're often lonely and they're sad and they're often confused. At times I wanna give up, but they can't afford me to. So you need to point out negativity and you need to fight against it. The other day I was in the library and one of our sons came in and he said, I hate my life. I said, why do you hate your life? He said, well, I lost my key and I'm not gonna do dishes to get another one either. Because in our house, if you lose your key, you have to do dishes in order to get another key. And I told him, I said, you know, it really bothers mom and I when you say things like this. You really need to learn not to react that way. That's not a proper reaction to having lost a key. And so we talked about it. And we talked about it some more until he finally he seemed to get it. Well, the next morning he comes downstairs. He says, hey, Dad, I found my key. And I said, where? He said, well, it was around my neck the whole time, but the string had gotten turned backwards, and so it was on my backside. And so we just laughed together and we moved on but they cannot afford to be, you cannot afford to let them to be negative. The other day I was talking to her mom, to a mom and she said, you know, my daughter's always telling me about all these friends that she has at school. Well, I spent two days at the school recently. At lunchtime, she sat alone. At playtime, she sat alone. She wants to have friends and she talks about having friends, but the reality is she really didn't. The other day, one of our children, we, we have a baby, and one of our children came up to us and, and asked my wife, she said, Mom, when I was a baby, was I happy like she is? My wife had to say, no, I'm sorry, you weren't. You weren't a happy baby, you were sick a lot. So negativity is something to really strongly fight against. Sometimes it's easy to get into a cycle of failure with them like everything they do is wrong. It's never good enough. And so what we've come up with, we call it the 80% rule. If when doing the dishes they do an 80% good job, we, we praise them at that point. We say, you know, thank you, you did a really good job. Even though we know they didn't, we praise them anyway. And this helps to break that cycle. At that point, you can just let them go and then later you sneak back and finish the job. Or you say, you know, I would like you to do that one little part a little better. But you praise them at 80%. We feel very strongly that we have to set an example for our children. And sometimes setting that example is telling them the right answer. When you ask them a question and they, they don't answer you, or they, it's because sometimes they don't know. We assume that they know the right answer, but oftentimes they really don't know the right answer. Oftentimes that confusion because of the organic brain damage kicks in and they don't even know the right answer.
And so we often, we ask them a question and then we tell them the right answer to tell us. You need to teach them to forgive their biological mother who gave them fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. You need to teach them to forgive her. It's also important that you forgive her also. My wife and I went to prison to visit the biological parent, mother of, of some of our children once. And it was such an eye opener. I mean, here was this woman, now she didn't tell us this, but it was in her files that she was put out on the streets at 13 to make money for her parents' drug habit. You know, she never had a chance in life. She never had a, a good foster home or a good adoptive parents. She just had a hard life. People say, well, I don't know how any woman could do this to her children. Well, some of them do it because used to be doctors told women to have a drink when they're pregnant. But others, like this mother that we went to visit in prison, she never knew any better. It's all she's ever known in her whole life. So you have to forgive and you have to teach your children to forgive them also. Be involved in your children's education. This is a time when many children really start going downhill, when they really start getting in trouble. One is because they start developing friendship with people who get them into trouble. One national speaker once said, if you want to design the absolute worst place for fetal alcohol children, it would be the public school classroom. The first time I went to the head of our special ed department, I, I asked him, I said, how long do we try, have to try to keep teaching this one particular child the difference between nouns and pronouns? He told me the sooner we stop, the better off the child would be and the less likely he would go to prison. I knew I liked this guy. It didn't make any sense, but I knew that I liked him. He went on to explain to me that what we were doing was frustrating the child, that according to his test, there was no way he would really ever be able to grasp the difference, and that what we needed to do was work on life skills, life skills, life skills. So, he still is hammering on me, work on life skills. Our school is doing the best that it's ever been. Our kids do a lot of crafts, they do a lot of life skills, they spend two hours a day in academics, and one of our helpers the other day said, you know, they're getting more done in two hours than they ever got done in six hours. So it's really working for us. We really push life skills. One of the things that happen with the fetal alcohol child when when they enter into the third grade, school starts changing. We sometimes call it the third grade wall. It changes from concrete to abstract. In the first and second grade, the books are written. The boy is wearing a blue shirt. The question, what color is the boy's shirt? But when you enter the third grade, the book would say, the boy is dressed in blue. The question, what color is the boy's shirt? And the child says, I don't know. It doesn't tell me. See, that concept is too abstract. And as they go further in school, they even get to the point where A plus B equals X, Y, Z. There's no way that they can do this. And so it really becomes a problem. Another problem they often have is in retrieving information. You think about a stroke victim. And, and you see this person and they're trying to say something and you know that they know what they want to say, but they can't get the words out. Well, it's often that way with our children. They know what they want to say, but they can't get it out. I even had a child once that was over at somebody's house and he called up and he said, Dad? And I said, yes. And he said, uh, 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 and then he turned to the person whose house he was at and he asked the kid, why wasn't I called home? And the kid said to see if you could spend the night. So then he asked me that and I said, yes, you can spend the night. But it's that problem retrieving. And so it's not just a front, it's something that's real. One of the rules in our house is if you're going to buy or sell something, you have to break it, you have to come through dad. 
Well, one time two of the kids came to me and they had a broken plastic slinky. I'd gotten it for free at a convention one time. I brought it home and the one kid had ended up with it and wanted to sell it to the other kid for $5. And I said, no, that's too much. And the two were devastated. The ones, but I want to buy it. And the other one said, but I want to sell it to them. And I said, no, that's too much money. And they, I said, I wouldn't even agree to a quarter. And they said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, you could give it to them. And they said, oh, okay. And the one kid gave it to the other kid and they both went away happy. No concept of money. There's a story about a kid whose dad bought him a used car and they worked together, they fixed it up. He paid $1,400 for this car. And the son turned around and sold it for 40. No concept. And time becomes a problem. Digital clocks are neat because kids can usually tell you what time it really is using a digital clock. But it has no meaning. The other day, my wife, three of the kids and myself had gone to town and we were on our way back. And my wife called ahead on the cell phone and said, we'll be back about six. When we were pulling in the driveway, it was 20 to six. The one son, he was so smug about it. He said, you said we'd be home at six. We're late. And my wife said, no, it's 20 till. And he said, yeah, but you said it'd be six o'clock. So I tried to explain to him that we were in fact 20 minutes early. And he said it again. Yeah, but you said six o'clock. So I tried again. And my daughter piped in and said, you mean 20 minutes late, don't you, dad? There's just not that concept of time. Yes, they can often learn to tell time, but it doesn't mean they truly understand it. You need to give them the opportunity to go as far as they can. At the same time, I know of a girl who, she's smart enough to go to college. That would not be a problem. But she would not socially be able to handle it. Plus, she has a, an ownership issue problem. She'd go to Walmart and she would steal something and get kicked out. So they need to be protected. At the same time, you need to let them go as far as they can. But part of that will be, what can they handle socially? So become involved in your children's education. Educate the school about fetal alcohol. Become a team in helping your child.